welcome to, we call this the TDB, or our trolley display building. Okay. We do have all of our trolleys under roof. We're very happy for that. Um, and we talked about a little bit on the car about the weight of car 78 that you rode in on. If you look at this early car, 1905, there is actually wood underneath this steel. You can see how large the trucks are. And what else do you notice, the people over there by the doors? How high it is. No. It's very high. It's very hard to get in and out of this car. The motors had to be so huge to power the car to drag it up and down the hills here in Pennsylvania. This is the oldest car we have here. This is a horse-drawn trolley. Okay. We're not exactly sure of the year. It's around uh, 1890s, 1895. It's just before the turn of the last century. Okay. And these cars were quite popular um, around here in Pittsburgh. You can see it says Fifth Avenue Parks and Cemeteries. This ran on Sarah Street, if you know where that's at, here in Pittsburgh. And it was pulled by horses on steel rails. So now, let me ask you a question. Why go to all the trouble to lay rails to pull a horse drawn vehicle when we have a wagon that can run on wheels and anywhere we want to go. Anybody? Good question. Okay. Well, the answer to that is, is twofold. Number one, in 1890s, what were the streets and roads like? Dirt. Dirt. What happens with the dirt when it rains? Oh, it turns to mud. Oh. And now you can't pull a wagon. Oh. A wagon like this, full of people, on steel rails has very little rolling friction. So it was very easier for the horses to pull. But they also had their problems too. They created a lot of pollution. In the 1890s and early 1900s, there was thousands of tons of horse manure and horse children let go in every street in the United States. Okay? So they had their own pollution problem. Also, whenever they got sick, they had to go to the doctor. They had to rest a four or five hour stretch is about all a horse would do. So you had to change horses frequently. And while that horse was resting or in the barn all night, he was still using fuel. He had to eat and he had to drink. So the horse was a good preliminary step till Mr. Frank Sprague come up with the idea of the overhead wire and the trolley pole. And that made the big boom in our trolley industry. How many horses would it take, John? Two. Oh, just two? Two. On a small car like this, two horses. Yeah, usually a team. <laughs> well, again, you see the movies, four horses on a covered wagon, on the dirt. Remember, the rolling friction on this rail is a lot less than a wagon on a dirt road. We've got into the first practical electric trolley system. And of course, trolleys not only hold people, but they also hold freight. These larger doors were for freight to uh, your freight in, and the smaller doors for people. Now, it is not setting on the correct trucks. It would not normally be this high. We don't have the trucks for it. That's why it's like way up in the air. And here we go, Mr. Ford and his Model T car. Okay, this is one of the reasons for the fall of the trolley era. Mr. Ford made these cars cheap enough that the average man could afford one. Once they found out of the freedom, they could come and go whenever they wanted. They didn't have to wait for the trolley. It was a personal <coughs> means of transportation. Okay. Mr. Ford made just a little over 15 million Model T Fords. The largest production car in the world up until the Volkswagen, the VW Beetle. 
Everybody's heard the story about you can have any color you want as long as it's black. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody know the reason for that? Again, it's twofold. Number one, it was the cheapest paint out there. Black is cheaper than any other color. He was always trying to lower the price of the car. Number two, it would dry fast enough to get them off the assembly line. Oh. 250 bucks last production year. I think you're right. I have an advertisement for one and it was, it's $269. It's an old advertising ad. Okay. But you look at that today, an average wage in that time period was probably about three or four hundred dollars a year. a year. So it took a full year's salary to buy an automobile. Again, today it still takes a good full year, unless you're going to go out and buy a, 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 a Maserati or some exotic car. But if you want a normal Ford or a Chevy or a small minivan, you're going to spend about a year's salary to buy that big, forty to fifty thousand dollars. Unfortunately, this car is down for repairs, or we would be riding it today. These, these were very, very popular. They called them summer cars, obviously, because they were only good for summer use, unless you lived in Brazil or New Orleans or someplace like that, where it was warm all the time. But around here in Pittsburgh, they were only good for summertime type use. But they were very popular because of, in the 1920s, nobody had an AC in their house. If you lived in Pittsburgh, the coal city, the steel city, it was very smoky, it was very hot, very sooty. A lot of people in the evenings would get on these and just go for a ride outside the town just to get cooled off and get a little bit of fresh air. This car originated by, uh, was built by J.G. Brill, the same company that built the car that we rode down here on. They built all the iron work for it. They shipped it to Brazil, and in Brazil they did all the woodwork and assembled it, and this car is actually from Rio de Janeiro. So I believe this wood here is Brazilian, what they call Brazilian cherry on the seats. So we were very happy to get this car. We have had it about eight or nine years. Um, we had to totally redo it, but like I said, unfortunately it is down for repair. Our other famous car here, car 832. Anybody watch the movie Streetcar Named Desire? Anybody ever heard of the movie yeah, Streetcar Named Desire? <laughs> if you look at the, the uh, front on this car, this car says Desire on the front of it. This is the original Streetcar Named Desire. It is from New Orleans. We purchased this car in 1964 for $1. New Orleans didn't want it anymore. They deemed it unnecessary. But we had to pay the shipping to get it up here, which was quite expensive. It's one of my favorite cars to operate. It's really a, a fun car to operate. All right, folks, we're going to take a real quick peek at Wexford Station, and then it'll be about time for us to leave. And of course, this is one of our work cars here. These, these work cars are all functional. They do a lot of work around the railroad here. I believe you see this is a train car. What do they use that for? Picking up rail and stuff? Picking up rail, redoing new rail. Um, if you went on the ride up to Arden, the creek that runs past there, there's a lot of trees. A lot of times a tree will fall in that creek. So we've got to get it out of there so that creek does not rise up and flood our tracks, which it has done several times. Oh, she, likes to wind that, she likes to wind that controller up. On this end of the tracks, 